What's going on, everybody? I'm Jeff St. Pierre, and this is episode 129 of the Adult Education Podcast. This week, I'm speaking with country artist Tyler Rich. Thank you so much for checking out my show. If this is your first time joining the Adult Education Podcast, I hope you like what you hear and that you stick with us. I'd really appreciate it if you would take a second to leave a five-star rating on whatever platform you're using, maybe even subscribe so you can be updated on future episodes of the show. Also, feel free to share the show with your friends. Word of mouth is the best way to inspire new people to check it out. Sorry, it's been a couple of weeks since my last post. It's uh, summertime, so I've been spending a lot of time with my family. My wife is a teacher, so she's got some more time during the summer to hang out. So we try to do as much as we can. I'm trying to get things back on track, though, and I've got a great conversation for you today. A few years back, I was introduced to this up-and-coming country artist by the name of Tyler Rich. I met him when he was out on what is known as Radio Tour. That's when record labels take their artists to radio stations to introduce them and get their music in front of people who would play it on the air. Tyler and I kind of had this weird instant bond over our love of dogs, specifically huskies. He's had huskies for a very long time. and At the time, I also had two huskies. So that was kind of our, uh, our introduction point. I shouldn't be surprised that Tyler is a Husky lover based on the way that this conversation went. It's kind of all over the place, like a wild Husky would be. Actually, I I feel like the way he talks is more like a Labrador retriever, but I'll stick with Husky for now just for the sake of this conversation. I met Tyler back in 2019, and we've stayed in touch through social media over the years. We finally got a chance to sit down and have a good chat about how he found music, how he got into country, his crazy work ethic, and how social media took his career to a whole new level. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Tyler Rich as much as I did. Yo. There he is. What's up, man? How are you? Sorry. Got a freaking this physical thing. I'm just getting old. My knee is broken. I had to go... (laughs) literally just had to go to an ACL doctor for physical therapy. And it just, uh, it went a little long. What's going on, man? How you doing? I, I, I'm better than you, apparently. <laughs> Dude. So it sucks too. He's like, he's like, uh, cool. So let's, uh, I've only hung out with or gone to basically his like doctors, his physician's assistant, I guess you would say. Um, got a steroid shot, didn't help. Got the MRI that we're like, oh, so you got a bunch of fluid around your ACL. Like, uh, so like, what was the injury, man? What caused this? Blah, blah, blah. I was like, well, I turned 37 in February. Um, <laughs> I think that's it. That's funny because when I turned 35, my body gave up on me. Like I started having a series of health issues. I'm not even kidding. Like the day after I turned 35, I went out to go for a run and I just was like halfway in. I was gassed. I was like, what happened? The only thing that changed is I turned 35. That's so relatable and it's so sad. And I can't run anymore either is what he just told me. He's like, What's your uh, favorite kind of cardio? I was like, oh, well, I mean, I like to run just over COVID. Maybe that's where I injured it. Over COVID, I started running like habitually and like on a program for the first time in my life and was clocking like 50 miles a month kind of thing. And nice. um, it, it also, it got to this point where it was like euphoric almost. So that's maybe where it came from. But he's like, well, you got to stop running. All your cardio has got to be from either on bikes or ellipticals or stairs or something, blah, blah. And I was like, because running and walking is the worst thing for your knees. And I was like, all right, well, Peloton it is. <laughs> So how, how does that impact your performances then? Because you're not exactly a guy that stands still on the stage all night long. Yeah. I don't know. He also brought that up and he said, he's like, do you think this is performance induced? Blah, blah. And I was like, I stomp a lot. I usually got boots on either lace up or cowboy. And so that, and he goes, yeah, I should probably stop stomping so much. And I was like, I'm probably just going to keep doing my thing. And then physical therapy and all this stuff and the medicine, it's going to work eventually. He's like, all right, well, I'll take that path with you and we'll figure it out. And I was like, oh. well, I'm curious. Did he say anything about surgery? Like would surgery be an option? So that's what we're hoping we don't have to do. Sure. And yeah. so he, yeah, he's going to put me on like all this uh, anti-inflammatory stuff. And then I'll continue the physical therapy and the stretches and the lunges and squats and all this stuff. And he's like, uh, he said, if this doesn't work after six weeks, or at least like improve at all, then we'll do a different six week round of more intense. And then if that doesn't work, I'm going to go in and drain it is what he said. Mm. Um, and I was like, honestly, if you just wanted to cut it open and drain it right now, as long as you got touch and bone and you're just like getting the fluid out, let's just go, let's just get it done. But what's crazy is like, to me, both my legs, both my knees feel fine as far as, um, like regular strength of life. But then my right leg, if I'm super active all day or I'm like walking around from like getting till night or whatever, it swells up so much mm. like in the back of my knee that I can't, I don't even have full motion. Like I can't lift my own leg into a car. I've got to pick it up. And that's like the swelling in the fluids. So I was like, just, just get that shit out, man. Just <laughs> Then he made me look at my quads and he's like, you see how your left quads much stronger than your right. And I was like, 
well, I'm seeing that now. And he's like, because you've been favoring your left for so long because of the way your right feels. And he said, your right's never going to get better until we get that right as strong as your left one is again. But to me, they're like exactly the same. So I don't think any of this is going to work. Yeah. But we're going to fight. <laughs> well, I, I, I don't want to, you know, give you false information or false hope, but I was just listening to a podcast a little while ago about medicine and they were saying they did like a big study where they took a group of people, half of them got medicine and PT, the other half got a placebo and PT, and they were really trying to test to see if physical therapy could solve a lot of the issues that people were taking medicine for. And what they ended sure. up finding was the people in the placebo group who took the PT ended up feeling better overall than the people that even had the medicine. So who knows? The physical therapy could be the way to go here and you could find yourself on the other side in great shape. I'm glad you told me that. It gives me more uh, more more faith in the process. I've hated squats and lunges and shit my whole life. Like No one likes them. It's my least favorite thing in the world, but I like it a hell of a lot more than the other stuff, you know, like a, or a hell of a lot less than the other exercises. And so, yeah, maybe this will get me like all pumped and then I'll finally have like strong legs for the first time ever. All right. I don't want to go down the wrong path here, but are you and Sabina thinking about children at some point in the future? Yeah, for sure. Well, um, getting your squats down now will be very helpful for when you have a child. I've noticed like that was the one thing that killed me. Not that I wasn't like in some decent shape as a human being, but like constantly getting up and down and like my back from lifting her up and over the crib all the time. I was not prepared for all of those like really random just movements that you take for granted every day. <laughs> yeah. There should be like physical training and stuff preparing you for yes. like just getting your core ready for those pickups and all that stuff. That should be like the prep classes right there. Like forget telling me how to breathe or whatever. Like let's talk about physical therapy for having a child. hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. We're, uh, we're, we're, we for sure would like one to two of them. Sure. And we're, and we're not young. So we're in the process of, uh, trying to, well, we're in the process of practicing, but then we're also cut. Uh, we live crazy lives, man. We have like, we have a place in California, we have a place in Tennessee and we're just like constantly back and forth. A lot of times we're apart, you know? And so I know that babies rock and change everyone's world. Oh yeah. Uh, there's no easy way, like in any married situation or not married situation, but the fact we're in different States across the country and kind of have to be, and I'm just picturing like me alone on a bus with an infant, her alone in LA or in Canada where she shoots her show right now with an infant, you know? And, uh, I don't know. Our whole world is going to change so drastically when it happens, but we're running out of time kind of waiting for the right one, if that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, I, I always hate to look at it as a running out of time, but I do know what you're saying. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think you, you're you at least conscious of the fact that it will change your life. You know, like there's a lot of people that just jump into it and then go, oh crap, what am I supposed to do with this? But so I, I'm glad that you're at least thinking about that, like from the perspective of, wow, we both have very different careers, separate pathways in a lot of ways, you know, we're united, but it that united, you know, takes us in different directions a lot of times. And it's going to take us in separate directions with a hell of a lot more work. And it's already hard enough to coordinate our schedules yeah. and like the chaos we we already have. And so it's, uh, but, you know, it'll be a, a cool little beautiful disaster when it happens. <laughs> <laughs> beautiful, beautiful calendar disaster. Well, I can say when we had our daughter, we had two Huskies at the time. Uh, one of them has since passed, uh, but they were so freaking amazing with our kid. Like they have just been the greatest dogs. The one that we still have uh, her and my two and a half year old are like the best friends. They just hang out together all day long. It's like, so, so you've got that for you. If you do end up going down that road. Yeah, that's sweet. And our, and our puppy, uh, Yukon, he, uh, when anytime he's around like our friends, kids, they're just, he's just so freaking sweet and gentle. And just like, I don't know. It's just like, he's the perfect dog for when we do. I was Abby would have been also. Abby was extremely stupid sure. babies, but I feel like it's a it's a husky thing. You know, I mean, we I mean, obviously, I'm assuming your algorithms on social media look a lot like mine and music and huskies. Um, and it's uh, and I feel like it's like I just constantly see huskies in the most adorable videos with kids and babies and sleeping and just yeah, it's just a cool breed. I mean, you know, it's it's the best breed. <laughs> I was talking to somebody about setting up this conversation with you and. They're like, so do you know Tyler? I was like, you know, I met Tyler like once in the office on radio tour, but I feel like I've known him my entire life. And I feel like that's a Husky thing. Like, I don't know why, but I feel like because of that connection, we've been friends for decades. <laughs> yeah, 100%.
I've seen other people in the radio industry so many more times than I think I've only once a person, maybe. Yeah, twice, I think only once. Yeah. So many, so many times since then. Yet you're the only one that like we DM dog videos back and forth. <laughs> right. Which is awesome. I want to uh, I want to go back a little bit on you because I I think your career is fascinating in a lot of ways. And I feel like what you've been doing is what a lot of folks are kind of picking up on now. And you were one of, I don't want to say the first, but you were one of the first of this new group of people that were developing a career before making the move to Nashville, where I feel like there was a long period of time where everybody just moved to Nashville and was like, okay, I'm going to come here and I'm going to just start my career now. You were like, I got to start building something before I take this product to Nashville. And I, I love that because it kind of gave you a great base, a great starting point to take that career to the next level. So I want to take it back a little bit and just talk about where you're from and learn a little bit more about how you got to that point. So tell me a little bit about growing up. Yes. Uh, so I grew up in Yuba City, California, uh, which is middle of nowhere, like two, three hours north of San Francisco. And um, I used to always say it's about 20, 30 minutes from where John Party grew up. Okay. But now we've also got Nate Smith. Nate Smith grew up actually north of me um, about 25 minutes. And so um, we're all from this tiny little random farming pocket in Northern California that is uh, an incredibly cool spot to grow up because just close to just uh, any and everything you could ever want to do, uh, but getting to get raised still in a small town and small area and community that you could uh, feel attached to and just still be in love with, even though I live 2000 miles apart from it now. And it was a, uh, yeah, just a cool little place that introduced me to a lot of cool things like country music and all other genres of music too. I know you commented on my turnstile <laughs> shirt that I was wearing. Uh, and which is so funny because there was a comment on that video too, of somebody tagged like turnstile shirt and the person for sure listens to turnstile and only probably hardcore and metal and stuff. And then they're like, why am I, why did you tag me on this post? <laughs> I was like, hey, you got to have a soft side too. I know you love my soft country. It was just a really cool pocket to grow up. We called it the hub because we were close to everything from like, if you wanted to go to Lake Tahoe, it was 90 minutes away. If you wanted to go to the beach, uh, Pacific Ocean right there, it was 90 minutes away. You want to go to a big city, Sacramento was 45 minutes away. Uh, and that was the same thing as far as genres of music go too. You know, we grew up in such a small little area where everybody listened to country because it was just farming in a small town. It's what everybody listened to. At the same time, like in Sacramento, there was Papa Roach and there was mm. Deftone. Uh, there was Cake was from Sacramento. Um, and such cool, iconic bands in that scene at that time that, and San Francisco, not too far away, you know, it was Metallica and then you got Bay Area hip hop. And it, so like all this musical influence and genre flooding our brains is just kids picking up guitars for the first time. It's just I felt very lucky for where I grew up because of the constant influence from people and music everywhere. And I toured for a long time in different bands and stuff. And then eventually graduated when I took a break, every band I was in just kept breaking up mm. and I was like, well, I'm going to go back to school. And so I went to Sacramento state and then got a degree in economics, which I wanted to do something that was different than music. Cause I didn't want my favorite thing in the world to turn into homework. Sure. And, which was very weird at the same time because I didn't care at all about economics. And I just picked the craziest schedule I possibly could to get out as fast as I could. And then that is when all of this really started for me is because when I was in those bands in my early 20s and even late teens touring around, uh, my grandparents and my mom, they would say, you know, Tyler, if you're going to go out here and chase your dream, we'll pay my only bill was my car payment back then. I didn't even have rent or anything yet. And they're like, we will pay your car payment every month while you're on tour if you're going to go out there and chase your dream. And so that kept me on the road, which was awesome. And shout out to Red Robin. I served bottomless fries and ranch <laughs> forever. And they let me tour. They let me just do whatever I wanted and always give me my job when I came back to town. And But when I did decide to take the school route again and I went back to the university and finished, I had promised myself that if I went back, I was going to give music one more shot. But I promised my grandparents, if those bands didn't work out, that I was going to go back to school. So I finished my promise to my grandparents, and then it was up to doing the promise for myself. And so the craziest thing about getting that econ degree was that I somehow did really well. Um, I graduated with honors, and so I actually got scouted for a financial advisor position oh, wow. working, with, uh, working with this company for the 
basically the controllers of like the state of California because the capital is in Sacramento. Sure. All of a sudden, I wasn't going to be making tips. I was going to be making six figures out of college with student debt now and, and health insurance and all yeah. sorts of stuff. I'm like, oh my God, this is crazy. What is this? So I turned that down and just moved to LA. And I was like, if that came now, it'll come again. And I was like, I got to give music one more shot. And so, and then when I got to LA is when all the, the chaos of the, the pre-work before coming to Nashville really kind of kicked off. I'm trying to think of the order it went in. I went down there blind. I'd already lived there once early in my 20s. Okay. Then I moved back chasing a girl to my hometown. I remember I didn't even know her. I just met her on Facebook. And I don't know, sometimes like <laughs> if you're ever going through a hard time in your life, you know, and you're even subconsciously, it might not even be like on the tip of your tongue. It might be like buried in your brain, but just that feeling of like you're just grasping for one thing to tell you to go sure. somewhere else. And so this girl, we started talking on Facebook and she was from like the town over that I grew up in. And I was burned out on LA already. And I was like, all right, I'm going home. There it is. No idea if I was ever even going to go on a date with this chick. We didn't have dating for four years. And then uh, ironically, she wouldn't move to LA with me after I graduated. So I moved alone after four years, <laughs> went back down. Yeah. And, and then so basically all these songs about her just started popping up and just like the new things I learned about my friends uh, and my family now living in my mid twenties back home and not just as a teenager. And I just started writing all these songs about that and, and how much I didn't like her anymore. And I hated her. She sucked. Blah, blah, blah. And so <laughs> at this point in my life, musically, it was cool because I got to be fully creative by myself. I got to, I wasn't in a band anymore. It was just me and an acoustic. And I met these producers down in LA. It's almost kind of like a, like a super band type thing, except for none of us were super, we were like, none of us were superheroes. It was just a, but this guy, he picked me as a singer because he knew I was out of a band I used to be in. And then he picked this drummer that was from Germany. And then this guy had put the four of us together in this super band that wasn't super. Because, you know, super bands are always like singer of Stone Temple Pilots right. goes and plays basis of Incubus. And, you know, this was nobody's ever heard of any of us. <laughs> um, but the guy was brilliant, like you know, and, and he's huge right now in what he does with Latin music, which is not what we did but he put us all together and it was one of the coolest and like craziest growing learning experiences ever i just realized i've also been talking for like 10 minutes yeah i was gonna about, stop you when you were done with this part of the story but go ahead <laughs> yeah uh, sometimes i just ramble and i rant and i rant and sabina my wife here i am doing it already she says if i'm telling a story it looks like this yes yeah well it's interesting too because like we're we're looking at each other through the video screen but like it's difficult to interrupt someone in a zoom conversation because you're you're just a hair behind them in the conversation so i i wanted to kind of get to a point where you seem to be wrapping it up but let's go ahead and dive in because you brushed over these earlier bands that you were in and now i'm so curious because you talked about how all the different influences were there where you grew up what were these earlier bands all about were you i mean like was country always in your mind or did country kind of come to you later so country came to me as a fan as 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 a really really little george Strait when his movie pure country right oh, yeah. which is like when we, when you know in the early 90s that was like the equivalent of hitch with will smith in my mind george Strait, you know he was teaching everybody how to make a woman fall in love with, like it was the perfect chick flick right and so i remember being a kid and loving that movie because I loved the soundtrack and I loved that he actually performed and sang in the movie and stuff. And it was like, it was awesome. And so I think I was eight years old and my cousin, Brad, he said, um, he's like, Hey, you know, Dusty's a real person. He's a real country singer and he's playing at the arena in Sacramento. Mm -hmm. And so he took me and Red Aikens opened the show, which is cool. Cause you know, Rhett wrote my first single the difference. Rhett and I have written songs together now. So it's kind of a cool full circle moment. And so getting to see George Stray is what really started my love for country music. Okay. Which then led into when I was 14 and I got my first guitar. And the first thing I wanted to do, it was electric, was just turn the distortion up and play stuff like Creed and Metallica and Papa Roach and, <laughs> all the, and Lincoln Park and like all this stuff. And my uncle, Tim, is the guy who really taught me how to play and sing and stuff. But the heaviest thing he ever listened to is probably John Denver, right? Oh, he was just wow. like, and he's not even necessarily much older. Like I have a, an interesting generational family, whereas in, my mom is the oldest. And then I'm the oldest. And then my dad was the oldest of his side, but like all their little brothers, mm. my uncles, we never really felt like we were that far apart in age, even though we were, because they were like the young, cooler ones. And so my mom's side, those younger brothers, my uncles were like skaters. They listened to punk rock and took me to my first hardcore shows and skate parks and stuff when I was a kid. And then uncle Tim on my dad's side taught me how to play guitar. And so he was the one that was 
he only ever played acoustic. And he's like, man, he would just teach me like, if you're sitting in this room because we had family parties, barbecues, Christmas parties, birthday parties, whatever it was. It wasn't just barbecues. And we always had guitars even before I could play. And it'd be my uncle and all of his friends in a huge circle just playing anything from Brooks and Dunn to Garth Brooks. Garth Brooks was like our number one. I know it's everybody's number one, but back then, like the dance is like my entire family's favorite song. And so we don't ever get together and not all just like kumbaya to the dance (laughs) as we play. He taught me the importance of songs that make people sing Mm. and feel something and songs that can make a whole party of people that are more interested in hot dogs uh, pay attention (laughs) in the corner. That whole part of my story is where my love for songwriting and love for even different parts of like rock and roll country music, like the Eagles and CCR. CCR is my favorite band of all time. John Fogarty is my number one all from that part of my life. And that all led to, you know, now I'm 16. I'm meeting other guys in high school that play music and whatnot, but in a small, small, small town. And it doesn't mean I even would have played country music in high school, but in such a small town, there's only one bass player. That's a sophomore. You know, there's only, there's three drummers. One of them is marching band. One plays in his garage. Uh, And so the guys I met, we're really into Blink-182. Wait, really I mean, in the green. 16 would be like, what, 2001 for you? 2002, somewhere in there? Yeah. So yeah, yeah, I mean, that's the heyday. I mean, it's Blink-182, Newfound Glory, like that's some 41. That's the heyday of all of that stuff right there. Yeah, 100%. And and honestly, and it's the funnest stuff to play in sure. a garage, pissing off neighbors, right? You know, we would, I don't know how we got so lucky that the drummer, my friend Tracy, his parents let us play in his garage two days a week, every weekend, and none of his neighbors complained. And we would even play stuff like AFI, like some pretty, like some noise driven punk rock stuff, you know, and, uh, but it was so much fun. And then that turned into when I graduated high school, you know, those bands all broke up, people went to college and stuff. And then I got an offer from, I was working at Red Robin and I remember the drummer of this band came in and he sat down he's like, he's like, dude, I remember your bands from high school. He was like, 10 years older than me. He's like, I remember your band's high school. We watched you play at these record stores and stuff. And are you looking for a new project? Because we need a guitar player. And so I just blindly, I didn't know any of these people. I just blindly went to this warehouse in the middle of the night. And there was a bunch of dudes older than me that tons of tattoos. It looked a little scary, but like, I felt like I could fit in. And they were playing this music that was cool and fresh. And I started this guitar player. And then we ended up turning into a, uh, cause the other singer had a, like a raspy, raspy voice. And so we kind of turned into a, a dual singing band as a four piece kind of like taking back sunday but i guess a little harder okay um i was 19 and then that band we got a record deal six months after forming and that we were on a label called rise records oh rise yeah yeah and then rise immediately when we signed to rise they started a merger with victory with tony from victory for distribution deal and so there i was 19 and our cd was in every fye every best buy what band was it never telling you come on uh, it's so bad and my voice is no, this high. i don't care uh, I, I i need to know what band this was uh it's called 10 falls fourth um okay but and then we got signed to a major in japan and we started touring stuff and then all of a sudden because of the japan thing we were going to go tour japan i believe it was with paramore because what was crazy is like yeah in best buy in my hometown in sacramento and san francisco and stuff you could see rcd probably on a front rack But then everywhere else, you know, super buried in the T's in the back. Whereas in, but in Japan, we were on the front display next to Food Fighters and Paramore. You couldn't read it, but like in every one in Japan, which was mind blowing to me. And we were about to go and then that band broke up (sighs) and we never got to go to Japan. We literally did one tour off that album. We never even did anything. Once it came out, it was like four months later, the band broke up. Um, And yeah, it, I mean, we had so much fun. I was, I mean, I was, I was a baby, man. They were like, the guys in that band were, I think, late twenties, and I was nineteen, traveling the world. But then that's when my grandparents were like, "Hey, you have a really cool opportunity. Do, do like definitely do this, and we'll take care of your car van." And so that's what I did for a long time. There's something else you said too, when you were talking about opportunities, and you were talking about how you got a job offer out of college, and you were like, "Well, if I get this offer now, I can get this offer later." But music may not always be an opportunity for me. And I remember I had a, a similar situation before going into radio. I was hanging out with some friends who were in the band Something Corporate, 
And uh, I was hanging out with them for a show and we were talking about how my job wasn't going anywhere. They were like, well, we need a merch guy for our European tour. Would you be interested? And I was like, oh, that sounds awesome. Literally that night, I met the program director of a radio station in Philadelphia at the show. And he was like, hey, I've been meaning to call you. Let's connect on Monday and talk about a job. And I was like, Uh, I was like, I I really, I almost took the touring thing because of the fact I was like, this will never come my way again. But I've been trying for like a year and a half to get a solid radio gig. And I was like, this also may never come again for me. (laughs) So I took the radio gig, which I I don't know. I feel like it's worked out okay. But um, definitely, definitely is something funny in this industry. Like I know I'm not in the same industry, but similar industry as you are. Like you do have those pathways where you're like, Oh man, like some of these things are once in a lifetime opportunities. You got to go with them. Absolutely. Yeah. And it was, uh, except for, oh man, that's a hard one because some of the corporate merch in Europe sounds pretty awesome. At that time they were like, it was their heyday at the time too. And I was like, I don't even have a passport. Like I, I got to figure all this stuff out right now. We were all drunk on Valentine's day, like hanging out in Philadelphia, but it, uh, ultimately everything worked out cause they broke up like a year later. So it <laughs> wouldn't really yeah. have mattered. But <laughs> You also had a, you also had a definitely a, a, at least a little bit of a, a sleep at night option, which was knowing that like, Oh, Hey, I had this, but option B was a for sure thing also. Right. Sure. Like, which is that that's got to feel good. Um, Music is never a for sure thing. No, it never, <laughs> no, it never not. is. It never is. It's still and, not. And Still something not. else you said there too, I think was so smart and something that you learned early on was so great is that you said you you learned the idea of songs that mean something to people and make people feel something. Like you didn't just learn about songwriting and learn about putting a song together. You learned about how to make people feel. And I feel like yeah. that's a step that so many people don't learn right away. Like the first thing they learn is, okay, verse, chorus, verse, here's how I write songs. Here's how I put a tune together. But there may not be a connection. And I think that, it's kind of what sets you apart from a lot of other people, at least at this part of your career of when you put something out, people feel a connection to that music and they feel attracted to it. Thanks man. It's like the best compliment ever. Yeah. I appreciate that. I put, I spend a lot of probably like too much time actually driving myself crazy over that. Like, so Jelly Roll, uh, did you watch this documentary? That came out recently? I need to do it. I just have not had a second to sit down, but I'm going to. I, I haven't watched it yet either, but in the trailer, or at least the trailer he had posted, he he says this thing, and Music Row is the most incredible place on the planet, right? You're surrounded by the, the most talent of all time. Sure. As far as like for people watching or listening to this, Music Row, Nashville, it's the strip where everybody writes, you're playing and writing songs with the best people in the world. But so many, he said something that resonated with me so hard, and this is just like two, a month ago that I saw this trailer, where he said, I spent over a year or something like that on Music Row going into all these writing rooms. And everybody sat down like, oh, hey, what's a cool title that we can flip into a twist at the end? Anybody got one? Anybody got a cool title we can flip? Blah, blah. He's like, nobody ever even looked at me one time and said, hey, man, what are you feeling today? Mm. What's going on in your life, man? And country music is, it's supposed to be songwriting, right? It's supposed to be storytelling of like the coolest, most interesting, true, real, what middle working class America is going through of like connect with the people, you know? And so I was like, man, I never even thought about it until he said that to me. I was like, that's so true. It's the catchiest, amazing, like most amazing music. Uh, but so many times people skip the the heart of walking in a room being like, yo, I felt this this morning. I started writing this and then just run with it without thinking like, will this get played? Will this? Because if you if you ignore the fact, is this going to get played on the radio? Are people going to stream this a million times because it's got a cool sing along moment in the chorus or something or, or a festival. And you really just put your soul into it. I mean, I would say 90% of the time, that's the song that people are going to be screaming louder at the festival than a catchy gimmick of some sort. You know? Yeah, I mean, the amount of yeah. times I've heard someone say, we wrote a smash today, and then you never hear that song again. I'm like, <laughs> did you write a smash? Like, did you? It feels good to you when you're writing it. I get that, and I think that's awesome to be positive about it. But like, but you're right. Like, Maybe there's no connection to it. There's nothing that makes someone feel attracted to it and makes them want to stream it again or download it or buy it or whatever or buy a ticket to your show. It's just something that's there. Yeah, and we try never to say um, smash the day you write it. You uh, are... <laughs> It's like saying Voldemort. That's right. you just, you're gonna have a shitty day if you say it for sure. <laughs> let's let's yeah. skip a little bit forward because we've we've we kind of touched on when you got into doing your solo project and became Tyler Rich as we know Tyler Rich today. You were coming out of your boy band because I'm calling it a boy band now forever that you were in a boy band because you talked about how a guy plucked you and put you with other. You were in a boy band, Tyler. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a boy band, 100%. And it sounded very much like it was a boy band. But what was a boy band without dancing? 
at least I wasn't going to dance. Yeah. No, but it, uh, well, it, you got uh, bad knees. So <laughs> yeah. Now, unfortunately, all these years later, yeah, it was one of the coolest growing musical experiences of my entire life because he created this boot camp, right? This, and he put us in these meetings with, so the, the, this production and songwriting group that is massive now. And they're pretty big then. They're called the Monsters and Strangers. I believe there's three monsters and three strangers. And they've written like, they wrote Zed, Mary Morris, maybe in the middle. They wrote like, they've just written everything from all genres. And so this is before all that though. And so they would sit down with me and Daryl Brown, who is a country hit songwriter that lives in LA. He did like Keith Urban, you'll think of me. He managed Leanne Rhymes, wrote a lot of Leanne Rhymes music back in the day when she was putting stuff out. Brilliant, brilliant melody guy, lyric guy. And he put us all together in this room and we don't even know each other yet, right? And so they'd be like, hey, write three songs, meet me back here, I was back here in three weeks with those three songs and we'll talk. So we didn't know what that meant. And we were just like, all right, cool. So we went home and we wrote these songs and then we went back and they sat there and they would pick them apart, mm. hardcore, in the best and the meanest, worst way possible, but necessary. I remember Daryl would look at me and he'd be like, hey, why did you... Um, why did you do this melody thing here or this part of this lyric? Seems like a strange choice. And I was like, oh, uh, I don't know. It's just what kind of came natural. And be like, great. I love it. Don't ever change it. It's brilliant. And I was like, thank you. Why did you do this over here? I'm like, uh, and he goes, I'm flaccid. Make me hard. That sucks. <laughs> Quote unquote. <laughs> I believe you. And like, so when he says it, you're like, oh shit, he means it. <laughs> Guys, get better. <laughs> it was the funniest experiences ever with these guys. And they were like, hey, change all your, make all your edits and then come back with three more. And so we did that rotation probably like four times. And then all of a sudden I remember one day I went in there and he's like, Hey, you know why you're here? And I was like, yeah, we're doing our thing. And he goes, no, nah, I'm asking me different this time. We were all talking and we realized that we're pretty sure you were just writing all the lyrics and melody and the music was kind of just coming from like tracks or whatnot. And I was like, Oh, I don't know. He's like, it's okay. They already told us in the other room. This was like, we're being like interrogated by cops. He's like, they already told us that's how the process was. And I was like, oh, okay, well then, yeah, I guess, yeah, that's the process. They've sent me stuff and I just write to it. And he goes, all right, cool. Like American Idol. He's like, we, all right, well, we send everybody else home. And so we're just going to work with you now. And so then they sent me with these producers that were signed to Universal at the time, I think, just acoustic, solo now. And so this natural progression to all of a sudden, and I'm like calling the guys, I was like, I love you guys, I love you guys. And the drummer ends up being my drummer for years. So I met these two guys, I was calling blind date rights when you walk in with strangers, and, which is very common in Nashville, where, but it wasn't something I'd fully really experienced in LA other than what I had just experienced with all these guys. And so now I'm in this room with these two guys, Mike and Jordan, who are two of my favorite people on the planet now, still to this day. And I go in there with just an acoustic and they say, okay, cool. So they figured out where I came from, what my influences were growing up the derivative of my sound um, and cool. So now you're not in this boy band. Um, <laughs> what do you want to do? And I was like, man, he can I just play some stuff I've been writing. I was like, because I had had these, a few acoustic song ideas back to what I was talking about earlier on my initial rant, which was <laughs> my ex-girlfriend from my hometown that I couldn't stand at this point in my life. And, you know, my best friends and my brother and all that stuff. And, and I was like, you know, they're kind of in the vein of country. And I was afraid to say it in this room because he, these guys are like hip hop producers. They do like pop and hip hop, basically. And uh, I was like, it's kind of in the vein of country. Uh, and they're like, oh, I fuck with that. That's cool. And I was like, really? What do you know about country? And they're like, uh, I don't know, like Tim McGraw, Kenny, Keith Urban, Garth Brooks. And I was like, we're going to get along great. Awesome. <laughs> so because that's like, you know, that's my wheelhouse, right? That's my vein of what I listen to. And so I played him a couple things and they were like, will you please let us do this with you? Because I had, tr I had tried with like different little avenues in the middle of that boy band thing. And it was like, no, no, no. Why? That doesn't make sense. What are you talking about? Blah, blah, blah. And they were super hyped on it and really excited. And so we just started recording some music, super grassroots uh, and no idea what was going to come of it. No idea what was going to happen. And I didn't know if these were going to be songs. I think we actually were writing these songs to pitch at first mm. and, no clue where what we were doing. And so I wrote this song called Radio and I put it up on Reverb Nation. This is before Spotify. Yeah. Before any of that. I remember posting that on my socials 
which were very small at the time because all we had when I was in my bands was MySpace. Well, this is like 2014 ish, right? So socials were still a different breed at that time. It wasn't what we know of them now. Yeah. Like not even close. Yeah. 2013, 2014 or so. I remember going on my Facebook, which is pretty much just my friends and family Mm -hmm. and posting this me just playing the song called radio. And their response was crazy. And it was just like, Oh my God, you found your voice. This is incredible. I love this blah, blah, blah. And, And then that hit the bug of like, go. Right. And so then we started writing, writing, writing more songs, producing more songs. And that's when I put it on Reverb Nation instead of me just playing it on Facebook. Now I have an Instagram account. This was when like Luke Holmes was doing six seconds on what's the app? It was six Vine. Vine, right? yes, yeah, yeah, Vine. Yep. I think Sean Mendez and Luke Holmes are probably the two biggest success stories from Vine. Um, and I was like, I don't know how to do six seconds, but I can do fifteen seconds, the max on Instagram. And so I did like Eli Young Band Dust, I think, um, and then I did Eric Church Talladega. I was doing one a week. This is important because then all of a sudden it led up to the moment I did Dustin Lynch's album came out. And I was listening to it. And my favorite song was Mind Reader. Mm. So I was like, oh, this is a random song. So I did 15 seconds of it. And I think because it was a random song, he saw it and his team saw it. And and then so I started getting emails from Dustin's team of like, hey, everyone in Nashville. But I think the really important part that I forgot in that whole thing is that that sounds like it happened in like three weeks. That was like a year and a half. So, but during that year and a half, I had started playing shows in California now as a solo country singer. And so to me, that was in the height of Cole Swindell was blowing up. Mm -hmm. Sam Hunt just came out. Dan and Shay just came out. And I would, I started getting booked shows strictly because of my connections from the last, from venues and promoters and stuff that I had met along the way. Thank God from my other bands I was in. And so I sent them radio on Reverb Nation. I was like, hey, what do you think? They're like, yeah, I'll give you an opening slot. And so I started getting these shows every once in a while. I started getting all these Vegas and Napa shows playing like back, not like playing background music for four hours a night. Think of what people do on Broadway in Nashville. Sure. Uh, uh, Acoustic during lunch or with the full band at night or during the day. And they'll play four hour sets to a party crowd of covers and stuff. Mm -hmm. So picture that, except for me sitting in a smoky casino lounge in a corner just me with an acoustic playing four hours, five nights a row, which was awesome because all of a sudden now I have a job just playing music. Uh, are you familiar with Andy Grammer? The yeah. pop rock singer. Yep. So Andy got discovered on third street promenade in Santa Monica. Oh yeah. His, yeah. His song, uh, gotta keep your head. Up. Oh, oh, you can let your head out. So that song is about playing on the street for tips in Santa Monica. Uh, and so I met him in my early years in LA I remember him talking to me because I was working at Cheesecake Factory and Red Robin doing this. <laughs> wow, double duty. Stuff. Yeah, at the same time. And working both. And he goes, why are you doing that if you want to be a musician? I was like, well, because it's funding so I can be a musician on the, like, go to these shows. And he's like, the only thing you should be doing to be a musician right now is figuring out how to make money being a musician. And uh, he's like, I, you should quit both your jobs next week so that you're pushed into an uncomfortable corner. And I was like, what? And he's like, just do it. And I was like, all right. And so I did. I quit both jobs. I didn't have savings. I didn't have anything. And he taught me what to buy and where to go and where to stand and what to sing and what to talk about in between songs to be a street performer in Santa Monica, Mm -hmm. California. So You'll be like next to a preacher. You'll be next to a person with a monkey. You'll be next to a a person selling Girl Scout cookies. You'll be next to a a rapper with with a boombox. And so that was one of the most defining times in my life for sure. But then that led to knowing how to sit in a room for four hours in a casino between that casino. And then those shows opening for Colson Bell, opening for Dan and Shea, Sam Hunt, all of them. I would get these little cards printed like business cards, basically. And these little promo cards just had a picture of me. And on the back, it said, follow me on Instagram. And I will message you a link to a free song because you couldn't get free music anywhere. yet. And so I would, you know, be playing the show with Cole and I would go out and I would, hand out 500 to the first 500 people in line. And then knowing that those 500 people are going to be the people in front of the stage, the closest to me, if they like me, they're going to go get a free song at the end. Uh, or at least maybe they'll at least follow me or say hi. I ended up going to Stagecoach Country Music Festival in Southern California. And I remember walking around that festival for two or three years straight. And I took 5,000 cards each year. And I would hand these out. 
And I told everybody, so Stacy is who actually books stagecoach. And now I know her personally, but I didn't know her at the time. And I was like, you know, you know, Stacy's got me coming back and playing next year. Here's a free song so we can sing along next year. Love you guys. Ne- I was never playing next year. I'm always lying. Um, this is the punk rock we, side of you, though. This is like this is all the punk rock stuff that you had from before. You're taking it into country, the self promotion, the the ballsiness, if you will, of going out there and just meeting. I remember, like that's how punk rock bands in the early 2000s would get heard. Like you'd see the singer outside handing out demo CDs to people as they were coming out. Like this is what you were doing. Like your background yeah. was coming to help you in the country music world. Yeah, I mean, guerrilla street marketing yes. it was like work. Uh, yeah, yeah, just. I mean, I even went around sometimes with. Um, like iPods, you know, same sure. thing in line. And then, oh, you want to buy a CD here? Two bucks, two bucks, you know, blah, 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 do the whole thing. And because of that, my Instagram and my socials were just on fire, you know? And so I remember then all of a sudden flash forward, getting calls to go meet Dustin Lynch's team in Nashville and going out there and then being like, oh, we love you. This is great, you know, but you got to live in Nashville. And in my mind, that was crazy because I was like, I live in LA. What else could I possibly need? <laughs> <laughs> so I go and visit it. And I think I knew by night one that you have to live in Nashville. Like it's such a community. It's such a family. Um, and yeah, so I moved to Nashville like four, three or four weeks later, like directly after that. So what year is the, is the move? So I moved in 2015. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Cinco de Mayo, 2015. All right. Then things do continue. And so Cinco de Mayo 15, which would have been after Stagecoach 15. So you did, in fact, get invited back in 2016 because I know that's where you met your wife. Yes. And I hadn't. Yeah, they did not kick me out for handing out the cards. (laughs) (laughs) So you did get the invite, even though you were saying, I'll be back next year. And here you are. You were back next year to perform. Not performing. Oh, no, no. No, no, no. I actually was handing out those cards the year I met my wife too. That's amazing. Um, yeah, I uh I did not hand one to her, but <laughs> I but I definitely had them. I met Sabina the good old fashioned way, uh just in the pit during Dustin Lynch. I knew uh, there was a pit meeting, but I guess I assumed that it was like she had seen you perform or she was familiar with you in some way. I didn't realize it was just, hey, here we are, two people watching somebody perform and I'm gonna talk to you. Yeah, it was I, I, on Friday, I was there. And at this point, I had already... So Dustin, I got there early 15, 2015 in Nashville. Dustin took me on his Hell of a Night tour, mm-hmm. which was four or five months, full US, end of 15, into 16. End of 15, into 16. Uh, and so now it's April 2016. That tour had just ended like six weeks ago. And so I'm at Stagecoach with all my friends. Like I would always go, we always get a big house and that's the country music festival in California that you go to. Now I know people in the industry though. I'm not just playing California shows, opening for people. I know Dustin and I know other artists because I've lived in Nashville. And so I remember it was Friday and I was side stage watching Eric Pasley and I saw Sabina on the other side of main stage watching. And I remember looking at my best friend and I was like, dude, who's that girl? Like, how do we know her? What band is she with? (laughs) <laughs> he's like, I don't know, man, you should go find out. And I was like, no, we just got here. I'll find out later. And then, so I didn't see her again. I didn't see her on Saturday. So I was like, oh yeah, of course she was with the band. She left because you're never there for the whole weekend if you're playing. And then Sunday I'm side stage watching Dustin sunset. And I look out into the pit from the stage and I saw her and I was like, oh my God, that girl's still here. And so at that point I had three days and a lot of Crown Royal in my backpack confidence to go say hi. And so I remember going down there and we just, uh, Posted up right next to her and said hi. And what's funny is I actually didn't recognize her from the industry. I recognized her because she's an actor. And so I'd seen her and stuff. Yeah. And she didn't no clue who I was. I mean, I was such a baby artist. There was like nothing to even, which is so cool because she's been with me for like the whole, you know, never, not any of the backstory, but like other than me running around handing out cards and the first songs I sang that are only put out independently, like she's been here for like the entire thing so far. It's pretty amazing. Been, yeah. And that was, May 1st, 2016 was when we met. Yeah. Um, and I didn't play Stagecoach until 2019. Okay. Because the difference was my first single. Yeah. That came early 2018. Okay. And yeah, I was trying to map out the timeline of that because I knew it was pre-pandemic when we met because you did radio tour. Um, so mm-hmm. uh, before I get into that, so you officially moved to Nashville in what year was that? 15. So that was the official move. You just made it. Okay. So then did you sign your deal right away? Like how long did it take you to get to that point where you were working with a label? I signed my record deal January, 2017. Okay. About a year and a half. 
I remember when I first went to town, I met John Party the first night. Oh, wow. Uh, which was hilarious because I got in town and I booked the only thing I knew how to do, which was um, I'm going to make some money while I'm there. So there was a bar called South that was in Midtown. Sure. And so I booked like a two hour acoustic cover gig on the stage acoustic. And these girls came up and like, oh, you're amazing. Blah, blah. I think you're going to love it here. Uh, do you, I can introduce you to anybody you want to meet. Of course. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, Nashville, right? And I still don't know if that was true or not, but like, you want to meet Brandon Gilbert? You want to meet Dirk Bentley? And I was like, um, I mean, yeah, that'd be cool. One day, do you know John Party? He was so new, you know, like, why do you want to meet John Party? I was like, well, you know, we grew up right next to each other. My uncle was his football coach in high school. I think it'd be cool to meet John. And so like, oh, we don't know John. So we go downtown. Now I'm seeing Broadway for the first time. I don't even live there yet. This is my first trip. And I go across the street to Rippy's. I leave my ID at this bar. And I go upstairs alone on this rooftop. I'm not with any of the people I just met. And John Party's sitting there alone at that bar top with uh, talking to uh, the bartender who was his girlfriend at the time. And I was like, do you have my ID? And I look over. I was like, you're John Party. And he's like, what's up, man? And uh, I was like, I'm from Yuba City. I'm here visiting. And uh, he was the best, man. He was like, well, what are you doing? You're here alone? I was like, yeah, I'm here for four days to check out the city. And so he's like, you're not alone, man. And he took me out that night to dinner with all of his like best friends. And I hung out with him for four days straight. And That's awesome. So he had like gotten me a lot of my first meetings sitting in different publishing companies. Um, he introduced me to his publisher. He introduced me to a couple other people that were just open doors to like start relationships. You know, nothing ever happens quick in Nashville. Sure. Then Dustin was doing the same thing on his side. So that whole first year living there was kind of hopping around between those contacts that they were helping me, which then turned into like, they gave me the best advice of my life. And that was you're new in town, right with any and everybody you meet, right two to three times a day. If you go to cookout, and you're ordering and the guy at the register is like, oh, yeah, I'm a musician. Right. With that guy. It's like, just go do the thing. Right. As long as you can, because it takes a long time to get into the cycle of the city. And so that's what I did. And I remember them telling me and everybody saying, like, you know, if you're going to get signed, like, who do you want to work with? What, what's your goal? Like, what's your what's your end game? What's your strategy here? And I was I was like, man, I love Scott Bruschetta. I was like, I think he's such an outlier to the industry. He's just like a go getter. He was like grassroots from bottoms up. He did everything on his own. He's innovative. He's, I was like, I just, I like his ideas. I think he's cool. I think he's edgy. I think he'd be the good fit for me. And I remember somebody, I don't remember who it was, but somebody told me, well, you need to make sure that your social media is unlocked because that's the first thing he's going to look at. Hmm. I was like, oh, well, I've already got a good start. And then, so I remember that inspired me to like really, really push those cards at shows more, get the following count up more. Dude, I used to go in between shows at that casino. And I would, I remember I'd go to Planet Fitness and I would sit on the Stairmaster for 45 minutes for our workout. And this is before bots could do this for you. Right. And I would go to like a Chase Rice hashtag, or if I'm going to go to a city and I know that and I, if I'm going to be playing in this city, I would look at what in two weeks, I would look at who's playing there tonight and say it's Sam Hunt is playing there tonight in that city. I would go, okay, cool. So the next morning I'd be on that Stairmaster looking at that venue's Instagram posts from that night at the Sam Hunt show and their hashtags and like and comment on every single one of those posts. For four, I, my hands would hurt for 45 minutes every, and I was probably as I was in the best shape of my life before working out. Um, anything to grow the social media, anything to grow tickets in those markets. And then, so then the bots started doing it and it ruined it because then it just became spam, whether it was yeah. a person a real artist actually doing it it didn't matter it just became spam and people were getting blocked and i was like all right that's cool but luckily when it came time to like we recorded a few sides and we're like let's let's start pitching these to labels now scott was the first school well, allison which is a and r at big machine was the first bite and so i went and had a meeting and allison was like i love this i love you and took me to go meet scott and i played acoustic for him and he was like this is awesome get your band out here from california let's do a showcase in four weeks wow. and so we did that. And then the best part is that I was at the casino, which was I had a lot of good times at those casinos and the wineries and stuff. Yeah. But it was pretty soul sucking for the most part. You know, <laughs> it, was, uh, it was nice that I could go to Vegas for five nights in a row or go to Napa for five nights in a row, fly home and write for two weeks and then go out there and not have to promote it. They weren't shows. It was just background music, make my money, go back to Nashville, write songs for two, three weeks. And I didn't have to be like, come watch me play all these cover songs. Like, cause 
the, I was doing the same grind that people do in Nashville, but I was able to create this fake, fake it till you make it persona. Like if somebody was on vacation to Nashville and they saw me on tour with Dustin Lynch, then all of a sudden they see me at Tootsie's and I'm playing cover songs in the bar, which is nothing wrong with that. Like if you're hustling and you're grinding, fuck yeah, go do it. It's what you have to do. I never had to have those moments of somebody that already thought I was making it. Yeah. All of a sudden see me doing this thing that changed their perception. Yeah. I just secretly did it in other places. <laughs> and I don't want to say that other people don't put the grind in because I think everybody has their own version of the grind, but I just admire what you did so much because you were, you were honing your songwriting craft. You're also honing your performance craft, which is a big thing. A lot of people can write songs like for days, but they can't perform or hold a crowd to save their lives. So you were kind of, you were just checking off all the boxes in your own different way on your way to getting the thing that everybody is searching for. And that's that deal to help take things to the next level. And it's a, it's a very unique, interesting process that I for sure feel very unique in doing it that yeah. way, which uh, it was cool. But the beautiful thing was like, when I got that call that I was getting signed to Valerie music company, which is part of big machine, I was in between shows at the casino and dreading going there that night. And I remember getting that call and just crying in a Starbucks parking lot and just being like, oh my God, this is amazing. And uh, I had regulars that would come to the, you know, the, the bar lounges at the casinos I was playing that would look for my schedule. And uh, they all ended up calling themselves Rich's Bitches. That's the fan club. Which is, uh, <laughs> I love it. Incredible. They're all, for the most part, they're all, I think probably about like 10 years older than me or so, you know, and so them and their husbands would come. And I remember we had like a big, like record deal signing party in California at this casino. Like once I finally did it and I was at this party a couple nights ago and it's uh it was all football players, all athletes. So George Kittle, 49er yeah. tight end, is, he's a good buddy of mine. He lives in Nashville. So he throws a big party every year. It's called Kittle Fest. And it's a bunch of players from the team, a bunch of players from other teams. And I remember I was talking to Trent Taylor's dad. And Trent plays for the Bengals now. And we were talking about what it's like getting a record deal in the process. And, and people think you got a deal, you made it, you know, blah, blah. And I was like, dude, getting a record deal is like, you got drafted. Yeah. Right. And it's like, it's just the beginning, which is crazy. It's like you get drafted and it's like, cool. What am I going to do now to be a starter? And so in sports terms, Trent's dad was like, that makes perfect sense. I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm still out here trying to sell jerseys, man. So you get the deal, which was said was 2017. The difference comes out, which was the first big single they pushed uh, for you. And I remember they came through before you did radio tour and they were so hyped on your story. And they had this whole like uh, sizzle reel EPK, whatever you want to call it. They were bringing by to show us George Briner and the team from Valerie. Um, and then you finally come through on the radio tour. We've got the difference going, but then the pandemic hits and that just like derail. It feels like it derailed so many things for so many people. Did you feel like that was the road? block for you like did you feel like a dam got put up in front of your progress uh, when that hit yeah i mean it was brutal we were on tour with lanco and my wife was working on a show she was working on la's finest which for her was the biggest tv show she'd been on yeah it, it's like jessica alba and gabrielle union, yeah, gabrielle union. Yeah. yeah yeah Gabrielle. they were filming this it's a bad boys movie spinoff and so she's in the studio doing her biggest show like we're ecstatic i'm on tour with lanco my career is doing this thing, going up, everything's beautiful. And then all of a sudden touring stops and there's a difference between thousands of people in a room compared to 40 people on a set. So even though California was the craziest as far as shutdowns, once it actually happened. And so I was the first one that was all of a sudden with nothing to do. So I got the dog, flew to California to, cause we have an apartment there and waited for her work to shut down, which was only a few days later. And so we're both sitting there both going from like what we felt was like the highest of our highs to like, oh my God, what's going to happen now? Her show eventually, because of all the COVID protocols, it was an action series. So they were already at like a million budget an episode. And then that pushed them to like 1.2 or three because of the COVID protocols and the masks and the testing and the yeah. stuff. So the show canceled altogether. With me, I'm like, what am I going to do? Go on Instagram live and ask for tips. I was like, I'm not going to do that. Like it was like the craziest roadblock, but then kind of like when Andy Grammer told me, quit your jobs, right. And, and go and make music, make money for you. I felt like that moment in my life, I was in the craziest corner. I, I, I pushed myself into on purpose to see if I could do it. So then all of a sudden now I'm in a different corner of the room being pushed by something I can't control, but I'm like, what am I going to do? I've got to do something. 
it didn't even necessarily, I mean, you know, like the government started doing the different grants and yeah. stuff for music. Luckily, you know, at this point, my business is legitimized. We're actually a corporation. So sure. my employees, my band members, my crew guys were able to get these grants through my corporation, which my guys are taking care of at least a little bit. Uh, we we're taking care of at least a little bit to get by. And so, but at this point though, like, okay, cool. Bills are paid. What am I going to do to make sure that this hype doesn't go away? Or what am I going to do to actually make sure it keeps going and gets higher? And so I was, we created this like show schedule over the week, which I miss so much sometimes, but my wife and I, our schedule is so crazy right now. We always talk about like maybe bringing back our Sunday show as a podcast. And every time I do a podcast, I think like, why have we not done it yet? I, you know, so I'm, we'll be- I'm shocked you haven't, honestly. Like, I'm very surprised that you haven't. I mean, again, I know your schedules are crazy. I get, I understand that. But like, it was so much fun and it seemed so effortless between the two of you. Like, your relationship is at a point where it just seems so easy for you to have those conversations, have that fun, have those moments that I, I'm shocked you have not capitalized on the podcast at this point. I know. We need to. I know. I'm actually going to, I'm going to take that with you saying it that way that you're shocked. I'm going to use that in my, in my mental get shit going brain right now. I'll be your Um, first subscriber when you do it. (laughs) Yes, please. I mean, it was so much fun. And for people that don't know what it was, so I'll start. So on Tuesdays, what I did was, um, it was called behind the sing between the scenes, sing behind the scenes or something like that. And so I would invite one to three different songwriters to come on and talk with me on Instagram live. And I would, and each say we had three, it'd be 20 minutes, 20 minutes, 20 minutes. And that songwriter would come on and they would tell the story of one of their hit songs, sing behind the scenes is what it was called. Yeah. And so, and that person would come on, they tell the story of one of their hit songs, everybody knows, and then they would sing it. Uh, and then the best part, which is kind of funny is that like a lot of times songwriters, huge hit songwriters aren't artists because a, they either didn't want to be or B they actually can't sing. Right. Like I write songs, with songwriters that are so good that can barely carry it too, mm. but they're, brilliant right and it's uh and so they'd come on and they'd sing and you'd see comments like what is this but people just tuning in that don't understand what they're watching and such a funny cool thing and then we'd laugh about it and then i would sing a song and tell a story of something we've written together whether it was out or just a demo and then another one and then it was over and that was every tuesday fridays my song feels like home came out and so i had feels like feels like home on the couch is what it was called or something and i would just sit there on the couch in our living room and play songs, take requests. And when I did those casinos and those wineries, I used to have on my iPad, you know, like all the songs I could do. And I would put request lists of five pages on these tables so people could pick a song and that would force them to come up and ask for a song and tip me. Just wonderful. Just the best. And so I busted out those old lists and I would just do requests on Friday nights, keeping people entertained. And then all of a sudden Sundays, which was our favorites, which we, uh, cause Lieber Wild is such a big song for me is we would do Leave Her Wild Sunday Brunch. And it happened naturally, which was the beginning of all the show schedules. It was the second Sunday. And I remember Sabina looking at me and it was, we were in LA and LA is always beautiful, like weather-wise. And she's like, we're off on a Sunday right now. You're never off on a Sunday. And I just wish that we could just go on a rooftop and do like a Sunday brunch with mimosas and you know, this stuff we never get to do. And I was like, I oh, know that sounds nice. Why don't we just do it right now? And so we jumped on and did Leave Her Wild Sunday Brunch. We just started organically inviting friends via text. Like, Hey, do you want to come on right now and just drink with us and talk? And they did. And so what that turned into eventually was a structured uh, variety show. (laughs) And so that is how I want to do the podcast Yeah. and have it just be called Lever Wild Sunday Brunch and, or just Wild Sunday Brunch, whatever's easy in the first 10 minutes, because everything was sad. Everything was bad news. I would call that section. What's good. And it was, Good news in America. Things going on good in the world right now. Funny, sweet things to talk about. What is Hoda talking about on today's show? Let's talk about that. That's always good. To then the drinking game, where we would invite couples on for drinking trivia. trivia. George Kittle and his wife. You know, it'd be like John Party and his wife. Uh, Just anyone from either of our worlds, from music to entertainment to sports, to come on and do trivia. And you would have to take a shot if you got the answer wrong. And by the end, it we were all just hammered. And then I would invite a guest on, talk about their new single, and then play it. And it was just one hour long every every Sunday. And as I talk about it right now, I'm getting fired up. <laughs> and I want to do it again in podcast film form. I wish I had them all taped. We only saved some of them. What were we thinking? Because you used to have to screen record back then. You couldn't even hit save. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And, and you didn't know what you were doing at the time. You were just doing it to have some fun and trying to keep engagement going, which makes perfect sense. And had yep. no idea that it would turn into what it was, which it was fantastic. I don't, I don't know if you ever get this where you see, you see other people through, say, social media or something, and you're like, man, I think I'd be really good friends with that person. My wife and I would watch your Sunday things, and we're like, we need to hang out with Tyler and Sabina. <laughs> Like, like this feels like something we would get down with. <laughs> I love that. And I love that you included me in that because I will tell you <laughs> the only thing I ever get told, which I love it because I feel the same way. And that's why she's my wife is everybody. I feel like your wife and I would be best friends. Never. I feel like we would be best friends. Uh, yeah. I'm going to get a shirt made that says here for puppies, Sabina and to be left wild or something. That's like people back shop, some sort of, yeah, as much as I could capitalize on merch sales at the expense of my wife, I'm going to continue to do that because it's been working. I do think you and I would be friends, Tyler. I think we could hang out. We have, I think we've got enough similar background that I think we'd probably survive. I mean, look, I did like two seconds of research on you before this conversation, and now we've talked for more than an hour. So I think we'd be okay. Dog parks and punk rock, dude. Let's go. That's it. That's it. So I, I'm going to fast forward a little bit because I only want to take up a couple more minutes of your time. But where are we at now? So are you still with Valerie? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I know you've been putting out some singles. You've had a couple EPs over the last couple of years. You recently did an Unplugged in Nashville EP, but what, what's going on with the career? What's going on with the music? How are things developing for you now? I know you're touring like crazy. Yeah. Co uh, constantly touring, but uh, also in the moment right now, I'm trying to figure out like what's next, what's get, what gets me to this next level. Um, and that is, you know, I was teasing music on Instagram, TikTok and stuff on socials a lot to get like, figure out what kind of stuff would work. Um, we had, you know, quite a few really big moments on socials, like better than we used to was middle of COVID that blew up on socials. And we put that song out right away, which is great. Uh, that really coded the last few years of touring, but better than you're used to. And so like right now, uh, just figuring out like what's next, what's, what's the next thing that's going to come out and pop and go crazy. Social media is constantly changing. Algorithms are constantly changing, uh, content that the platforms want to see you making compared to content that fans might be right want to see it clashes at times. So just trying to figure out how to get my songs and my content in front of the people that actually follow me is the biggest challenge right now. And so without paying thousands of dollars for TikTok to show my followers, my right. songs, <laughs> but, uh, that, and just, you know, yeah, picking out, I wrote, I wrote so many songs over the past few years and just figuring out what of those songs is going to resonate with people right now is like the continuation of my story and where I'm at. I have a lot of, Hey, I just met you. You're the best songs that are great, but I'm past that. I think because now Sabina and I have been together for so long. Sure. So, you know, like my song, I know you do that came out is all about which it was start off as a joke. When we were writing the song in the studio, it was like, I've written so many songs about how much I love her. How about what I'm going to write the song about all this shit that I do that pisses her off. And like the things we fight about the things that we don't agree on. And, but at the end of the day, like, I sent her a text message and I said, Hey, I just came up with this idea for this song. We just started writing it. Send me like five to 10 things, pet peeves, things that drive you crazy about me. And by the time that she sent it to me, we had already written first verse and verse two, which is all the things. And it was like, dude, she sent this list and we went through the song. We're like, Oh yeah. Yep. Yep. Hit that. Yep. <laughs> because I know her better than anybody, you know, and I know what drives her crazy. And so that's what the chorus came to life of like, even when you're mad, even if you go to sleep and you want to say, I love you too, I know you do. And so, and that song blew up on socials. They had like 10 million hits between TikTok and Instagram and stuff. Um, and uh, it's been just such an amazing, awesome live song for us and figuring out what's that next, what's going to be that next big moment. The acoustic stuff was fun just for me as an artist to be able to go in the studio and give these songs that have been out for a while, just a whole new life and a new identity, which was really satisfying for me as an artist and but as far as the new like actual cuts you know as much as i do yeah just when it happens it's going to happen but we're long i'm mean, long 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 overdue album two came out at the end of 2020 which is another thing that happened over covid yeah. was me tracking vocals at home and doing zoom like brady bunch with like other musicians with Lindsay rhymes my producer in nashville and uh other studio musicians and just sitting there and building stuff out at that point we had released a bunch of songs over a couple of years so i think only three songs came out to finish that album mm. and so we've just been releasing songs sporadically ever since but coming up on three years so overdue for a lot of new awesome music and 
Yeah, just touring, grinding like crazy, doing, doing the only thing I know how to do. Well, two things. One, I need you to come back to the Mid-Atlantic region because I feel like it's a region you have not been to enough in your career. So I need you to come back to hang with us in the Baltimore area because uh, I'd love to see you live. Uh, I've never seen you full band. I've only ever seen you on radio tour. So I'd love to see the full Tyler Rich experience at some point. Uh, two, I'm going to be with George Briner and Don Goslin on Friday, so I'll make sure I blow up your spot with them and make sure that uh, that they're aware of how much I'm a fan. So. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. <laughs> Baltimore close to Delaware. What's the... Yeah, yeah. It's like an hour Dewey from Beach. Delaware. Oh, Dewey, Dewey Beach. Beach. So Dewey Beach is on the, the shore, and it's surprising. If you look at a map, it doesn't look far, but it's probably about two and a half to three hours from Baltimore just because of the way yeah. you have to get there. So are you doing bottle and cork? No, we did last year, though, okay. and it was like one of our favorites. And so it's a great I would spot. be there next summer. I don't think we've ever even done a proper Baltimore show. Yeah, I don't Other think than, we have. Uh, Silver Springs, Maryland, I did on the yeah. on the Dustin Lynch tour and the Brett Young tour, I think. But that was forever ago. Yeah, it's been a while. And, and that Silver Spring is technically a D.C. venue. It's close. It's not far because everything in that region is pretty close. Uh, but it's yeah. technically a D.C. venue. But uh, but yeah, we'd love to have you back, man. I, I, I'm such a fan. I appreciate all of this time today. I, I gave me way more than you uh, needed to. So uh, I yeah. thank you. And uh, yeah, just keep up the good work. And I, I enjoy following along and, you know, watching the career grow. Thanks, man. You got me all fired up again. I'm like, I'm going to do some guerrilla marketing and it's going to be crazy. I'm here it. for you. First subscriber. I'm telling you, first subscriber. I got it. Oh, <laughs> podcast coming soon. All right, brother. All right, man. We'll chat soon. Take care. See you, man. Big thank you to Tyler Rich for his time. Check out his music on Apple or Spotify or wherever you get your music. And keep your eyes open for when he's coming through your town. You will have a great night out if you go catch a Tyler Rich show. And thank you to all of you for listening and subscribing to the Adult Education Podcast. I appreciate you so much. Until next time, be well.